So um, our next speaker for the afternoon, um, actually before I introduce Mike, um, a couple of things. When you walked in this morning, you would have got an evaluation form. We'd really appreciate if you could fill that out before the end of the day. Um, might, we might lock the doors if we don't get enough of those. So um, you may have to hand them in to get out. Uh, the other thing is, <laughs> and a what? Oh uh, yeah, so also on that form at the, at the back page at the bottom, if you want more information from the local land services or have our newsletters in your email box, just put down your contact details and we can make sure that you start getting our uh, newsletters and other things. The other thing we have is on our table at the back of the room, there's an iPad that's sitting up there which is another form of evaluation for today. Um, good, bad or indifferent, we'd really appreciate if you could um, spend two seconds up there and push a few little buttons to um, give, us, give us your feeling about how today went. Um, it's really important that as we do future events that we make improvements and make things better so that uh, you uh, get more out of the day. Uh, so our, um, our next speaker is Mike O'Hare. Uh, Vilia and Mike operate a uh, mixed farming enterprise at Beckham, which is actually not far from home for me and use hard seeded legume pastures in rotation with cropping. Canola and wheat are grown in rotation with legume pastures, grazed by stud and commercial sheep master sheep. So um, Mike's topic today is hard seeded legume pastures, um, the grower experience in a mixed farming system, and um, we welcome Mike to uh, share his experience. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, just as a bit of a lead in to these uh, hard seeded legume pastures, just give you a bit of an idea what we do, and you can see the sort of gear we do it with. Uh, actually, that's 1950, and my father with a new tractor in the background, the first tractor. So, Beckham is about a 19 inch rainfall area, and we basically 50% crop, 50% pasture in, in rotation. So we're producing canola, wheat, lamb, and now we've got this sheep master stud, which is going pretty good. A uh, little bit about the rotation. Uh, it's 50% crop, and then the pastures, mostly the hard seeded legume pastures with a little bit of loosen, because as good as some of the hard seeded legumes are, they're not, not like loosen, they're not annual. Uh, so in year one, the idea is to maximise the seeding of the pasture. And once the system's set up, in, they're regenerating from hard seed left from three or four years before. So you allow, allow them to set seed. Now this is probably one of the weakest links of the system because when you're allowing your annual pastures to set seed, you're allowing your annual weeds to set seed as well. So that is a bit of a weak link that I might talk a bit more about later. Year two, let the pasture go and then springtime, usually first week of September for us, spray fallow it before anything sets seed and to conserve moisture for the following canola crop. Year three goes into canola, and because of the, like in theory, we're reducing the weeds and so forth in the system, we're able to use conventional varieties, no need for a TT or Roundup Ready canola, and it's going in after cultivation, so we're able to use things like trifluralin on it, um, still use select, uh, but we won't use lontral because of the effect, carryover effects on the legume pastures. Then year four, that's pretty easy. Just get sown straight into wheat. Usually no need for any grass selectives. Might have an odd paddock, bit of ryegrass, might put a bit of box of gold on it or something. Uh, but won't take out a few broadleaf weeds. There'll be a bit of mustard or self-sown canola or something like that. Uh...
SUs because of the carryover effects for the legumes as well. Uh, pictures on the right, in case you're wondering, the top one's bladder clover, ready for well, well and truly matured. And then harvesting, well, I was going to say bladder clover, but to tell you the truth, I think it's actually bizarula. It's been windrowed with a hay rake and then pick up front. Uh, just a little bit more about how they fit in. Like, and I've got up the top there, low risk farming system. There's, there's probably no such thing really, but um, perhaps a reduced risk farming system as the basis behind all this idea. So it's half crop, the canola is going in on fallow and that often results in higher yields than canola on stubble in our country. Now, my estimate's about a half a tonne a hectare. Uh, so we can grow the conventional canola, which makes it a little bit easier sometimes. Uh, getting organic nitrogen. Uh, and from a disease point of view, there's four years between the crops, which is pretty handy when you're talking about control of blackleg and take all and all those sort of things. Um, and the system's also giving you some diverse weed management. So you've got grazing in there, a spray fallow, and uh, we're not using very many grass selectives in the wheat uh, and it's lessening the risk of herbicide resistance. That's not to say you won't have it. I, I do have one paddock. I know I've got a couple of patches of ryegrass that won't, that sorry, is resistant to select. So it's certainly still there, but it's managing that reasonably well. Uh, and from a stubble point of view, you don't need any fancy gear to handle stubble because you're only sowing wheat into a canola stubble. The wheat stubbles are being left out to regenerate to the legume pastures the next year. So a bit more about the pastures themselves. Um, and you're probably looking at the pictures. So the one on the right's bladder clover after the rake had been over it. And so a heap had already shattered on the ground after a heap of rain. Just gives you an idea of the... And I'm pretty sure that's bladder clover on the left. So half of the farm is sown to Bizarula. And if it wasn't for photosensitisation issues, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, it'd probably be the whole farm because it's so good. Then most of the rest of it is a mixture of bladder gland and arrowleaf clover with probably about 10% of the places heavier clay so we grow barrel medic on that which handles it pretty well. And a little bit of loosen for the reason I said before. These things are all dry in the summer. A bit of greenery can be handy if you get a bit of rain. So. All, all the seeds produced on farm uh, and it's seeding one year in four, which works most times, but I'm <laughs> not confident enough to say it's going to work every time. And I'm a bit worried about a couple of clover paddocks this year. The buys are ruler, no worries at all. Feeling a bit tired after lunch. I'm happy if you go for a bit of a snooze, but Wait till after this little bit on Visarula, because if you only learn one thing today, if you're growing annual pastures, you need to be growing a bit of Visarula. So just hang in till we talk about Visarula for a minute. Who's grown it, seen it, or? Okay, a few people have, yeah. Daryl's down there somewhere, good on you. Um, look, it's really tough stuff. And unlike most pasture legumes, it's got a little bit of weed qualities about it, so it's a little bit competitive. You've got uh, high seed numbers, so you often get a massive germination, so that helps. And it the ground, sort of covers the ground a bit. And then the next bit, I call it the all brand of pastures. The sheep don't like it, but it's good for them. So that helps in the competitiveness, because the sheep are preferring to eat the weeds than the bizarula, so that gives it a bit of advantage. But some of you are perhaps not interested in having pure legume pastures like I am. I want 
pure legume pastures because I'm growing them in rotation. So I want to maximise the nitrogen, minimise the weeds and minimise the disease carryover. So for anyone who wants to grow it in a more of a pasture, long-term pasture situation, some of the things I'm saying about the weeds and so forth probably don't apply as much, but for our situation all that's pretty important and works pretty well. Uh, another good thing about this stuff that can handle well, so-called false breaks easy, like there should be a law against summer rain for people growing annual pastures, you know that, because Febru that February rain, we get all the winter weeds up, all the summer weeds, you know, and what are you going to do with it? So we sprayed a heap of it out. And that won't matter because the visor rule has already come up again. But that summer rain is an issue with annual pastures, there's no doubt about that. But this stuff, it can come up in January and still, if you've got a favourable season, it'll still be half green at Christmas time. So, but the thing about it is in those January, February rains when you get all your subclover up, this stuff will come up and survive. It can handle 35, 40 degree days, days on end, as long as it's got a little bit of moisture. It'll just curl up and then flat on the ground and just sit there and hang on. Whereas your subclover doesn't matter how much moisture sometimes, just the heat will get rid of it. Uh, so that's one end of the season that works really well. The other end of the season, when the clover tends to gets a bit hot and dry in the end of September, October, and sort of packs up and that's it. And that's, that is it. It won't come back again no matter what happens. This stuff will sort of die down a bit and might be just a little bit of green stem on it. Then you get an inch of rain at harvest time. Next thing over the next 10 days or a fortnight, it's got little flowers on it and then sets a few more pods and just put on a bit of green leaf. Like you're not going to get heaps of feed off that situation, but it's got the ability to hang on through those conditions because of its deeper root system. Um, it likes well-drained soils. It'll actually grow on the clay, but as soon as it gets wet, it towels up a bit. So it's got to have well-drained soils. Photosensitisation. That frightens a lot of um, people who run livestock. But some people who say to me, no, I won't bother growing it because in case my sheep get photosensitisation. I say, do you grow loose? And they all say, yes. So well, what happens when they get red gut and bloat and those sort of things? And they say, well, they die. Well, the worst thing will happen with this stuff is the ears will fall off. So, you know, put it in context. And the other thing I say about it is that's a good thing because you'll only get the photosensitisation when you've got dominant Bizarilla pastures and they're growing rapidly. So it's not the worst thing that ever happens to you. But I'm not advocating letting the ears fall off my sheep either. So, um, but as you get a bit of experience with it, it's mainly the lambs that will have the problem. The ears will start to droop a bit. So, you, okay, you've got to look for somewhere to put them, just move them, even if that's onto another paddock of buys a ruler. They'll, they'll come good. If you leave them there long enough, sure, you might, might lose a couple of ears. But, the other good thing about it is it's, what you see is what you get with the photosensitisation, whereas with things like hairy panic, you get secondary photosensitisation, which can damage the liver and other internal organs. This stuff is only primary. They've done plenty of work on it. There's no, no effect on the internal organs. So it's only the, what you see is what you get. So it's not, not the end of the world. Otherwise, it would be the perfect pasture plant. Uh, just a little note on some of the herbicides for weed control. Propizamide's fine, Bradle's fine, Bromoxanol's fine. Not that Bromoxanol always does that much because by the time the Bizarrul is big enough, the weeds are too big to kill with Bromoxanol. So. And then at certain times you can get away with using things like on Igran, Tigrex. Last year I even put MCPA on some and didn't worry. It. So it depends on conditions, but none of those things are perfect. So. so you can go to sleep now if you want to. <laughs> but, um, bladder clover, 
I mentioned earlier we grow three clovers usually together, bladder, gland and arrow leaf for different reasons. Bladder clover, when it was first uh, released or we first found out about it, um, it sounded like the ant's pants, but I really reckon it's a bit overrated. It's a magnificent plant if you get it right on well-drained soils and it can be spectacular stuff and you can get some incredibly high seed yields off it and it's relatively easy to harvest. Rake it into a windrow and pick up front and not too bad. But it's very iffy with herbicides. It'll handle propizomide for grasses. Uh, broad strike's okay, but you don't add MCPA to it or it slows it down. So, but then, on the other hand, if you've got it in your fallow and you want to kill it, like you can't spray anything on it to control weeds in it, but then you can't kill it either. It, it's bloody tough stuff. So I'm not saying you can't kill it, it's just that if you put you know, a decent rate of Roundup and ester on it or something, it'll be the last weed to, sure it'll be pretty crook, but it'll still sort of be half there. So it's not a reason why you wouldn't grow it, but it's just, just frustrating from an agronomy point of view. Be nice if you sprayed it and it disappeared. No, that is harvesting bladder clover there. That was back in 2011. It was yielding about 800 kilos a hectare, and the ground was bloody near yellow with seed. There had to be more seed left on the ground. And plus, we, let, we left strips of meter or two, case, case of blue and so forth, just to protect the paddock. So unbelievable yields you can get off at some time. So if you're getting yields like that, you can afford to splash it around a bit. And if it's not the perfect plant, well, bad luck. Now, this stuff, gland clover, whereas I reckon bladder's a bit overrated, this stuff's probably a bit underrated. It's not the most spectacular plant, but you can grow it anywhere. It grows on all of our soils, heavy, light. Uh, in trials, they said its production is similar to, say, a Dalkeith subclover, but it, it's quite early, like you get season cuts out, which often does at Beckham, this stuff will still seed. If you get a longer season, then you know you want something else with it, and that's where the arrow leaf probably comes in. But it tolerates waterlogging, handles earth mite, just generally good stuff. Like, and a little bit of seed goes a long way, so you can put it in with damn near anything. And it, you can use your propizomide on it, handles MCPA, or broad strike MCPA works out all right for a lot of the broadleaf weeds. Spinnaker and Raptor, which I don't use them, but yeah, it's got a few more weed control options than some of the others. Arrow leaf clover. It'll grow pretty well on all of our soils. Uh, it's very hard seeded, but it's the opposite to gland clover. Gland clover will handle the tight finishes. This stuff, it needs a, you know, October rain like last year. In fact, that's what this paddock is. The bladder and gland is already underneath and, you know, half of it's finished. And then the good rain in October, so away it, away it goes. So that's why the mixture works so good. And it, it tolerates MCPA, so it makes life a little bit easier for the broadleaf weed control. Um, I haven't mentioned subclover yet, I don't think, have I? But we used to grow a lot of subclover, and I can see a subclover grower over there, Lisa, yeah. If you can grow subclover and happy with it, then sure, keep doing it. Because it's great stuff. You can it'll do all the things these will, and it's nowhere near as tough as them, and that's why we're growing these things. They're tough and we can harvest the seed ourselves. But subclover's got advantages when it comes to weed control. You can hit it with MCPA, Simazine, Gramoxone, mix the whole lot together if you want. You know, you can get good weed control in it. Whereas these things are a little bit harder. So I'm not trying to talk anybody out of growing subclover, but um, these things have other advantages. Uh, I didn't have any pictures of barometric, so 
There's a picture of the sheep master use. They've been eating a bit of barrel medic, they'll say. Um, barrel medic is a bit like the Bizarilla is for the light ground, the barrel medic is a bit the same for the heavy ground. Not perhaps as spectacular in growth, but it's tough and it can seed in tough finishes and it's a lot better than subclaver at handling those false breaks, so it, it's good stuff on our heavy ground. Then I got really short of pasture pictures. So. But, the, but this highlights the advantage of the sheep master sheep because these animals don't have very good leg structure under them where the sheep master do, so it's probably appropriate. But they've certainly been on a good paddock. But just to sum up some of the advantages and disadvantages of these hard seeded legume pastures in our system, they're really tough and because of the fact that you can harvest your own seed on farm it means you can splash some seed around with a lot less expense. Uh, and when you talk about Bizarula, you're talking about the competitiveness of them and the selective grazing helping with weed control and so forth. So it got some really good advantages. But looking over at the disadvantages, and this is where the subclover has an advantage over them in terms of weed control, if that's what you want to do. If you're in a grazing situation and you're not too keen on weed control, different matter. But as I said before, we, we're trying to grow these as, well, we'd like to think they're pure legume pastures, but at least, you know, the biggest percentage of the pasture be the legume. And you, as I said, the herbicide options are a little bit limited. And this, this is where a lot of research really needs to go into it, because if you could get reliable weed control in these pastures, they would make life a lot easier and add to a lot of production in a lot of areas, particularly to the west of here. So there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of scope there and uh, it'd be nice to think something might come of it one day. And as I said before, some of the disadvantages, like I don't, don't use Lontrel or SUs in my system or no Secura and then you're limited with MCPA in situation with some of them. Um, but I'm, I should say I do use a bit of Lontrel and MCPA and, and SU, sorry, but that, that's to kill them in the crops sometimes. Sometimes you get a massive germination of these, as you used with subclover in a, in a newly sown crop. Now, as a rough guide, I reckon it only happens about one year in four where you might have to control them. And, and they're easy to control, like 50 mils of Lontrel, that'll blow blow them away in canola, and a couple of grams of alloy or glean will blow them away in wheat, so it makes, makes life easy if you want to get rid of them. But usually the time, unless you're sowing quite early and the, they get a chance to get up and they'll grow quickly when it's warm and the soil's warm, you may have to control them. But usually when most of the crops are coming up, it's a little bit cooler. And of course, most of your legume pastures grow quite slowly during the cool weather. So if you've got a little bit under there, that's fine. And in an ideal situation, we often have a little bit seeding under our canola, which just keeping that seed bank ticking over a bit. So that's probably about all I can tell you because I know nothing about hippopotamuses. Thanks, Mike. Um, as, uh, as our program ran this morning, we will have a question and answer centre uh, session a little bit later on. Um, so we'll, um, we'll hold any of those questions off until then.